We are Steel Magnolias, two sisters who love family, traditions, and all things Southern. We've got plenty of room at our table, so pull up a chair. Hey, Lainey. Hi, Laura Beth. It is summertime in the South, but not really. Not it's technically, but it feels like it. Technically spring, <laughs> and we've got a very spring topic today. You know, a lot of times we talk about food on this episode, cooking, recipes, and things like that. So I'm really excited to share with everyone um, our topic for today. But before we do that, I wanted to let everybody know that we have a Pinterest page. Yes. And that is simply for our listeners to have access to said recipes and places that we mention on the podcast and gift ideas. I mean, there's so much. So many things. So much what we talk about here that really makes sense to organize it on Pinterest board. So if you are a Pinterest er, then <laughs> you're welcome. We I spent some time last week catching up on all of our episodes yes, today. Thank you for your hard work doing yeah. that. setting all that up from twenty six prior episodes. I know. Yeah, we've already had so many episodes. So that was um no small feat. But going forward it'll be, you know, we'll just add things as we go and uh, other things. It's not gonna be exclusively recipes or places or gifts and books, et cetera, that we talk about here. We're, we're going to pin things um, that stay on topic, of course, for Southern culture. But yes. we just really figured that would be a good good place to put ourselves. And, you know, it was really fun this um, couple of weeks ago. We got a really fun inclusion that I did want to make sure and mention in case anyone missed it. A magazine called Do South included us in their must listen to Southern Lifestyle podcasts. I was and so blown away. I was it too. was so fun. Because they, o- they only picked three. three. And I heard about it because of another podcast that we like. We like. The Southern mm-hmm. Fork, who is, uh, she is probably, I don't know, five or six years into podcasting. She's been doing yeah, it Yeah, and long she's time. a food writer out of Charleston, so she's yeah. got relationship with a lot of great chefs and that kind of thing. Yeah. Her podcast is adorable. Yeah, so she's definitely very focused on Southern food and the restaurant culture and all the things that are happening in and around that. So she's got a great po- podcast if you haven't checked out the Southern Fork. Um, we enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, like I really I enjoy that one. But yeah, she had posted something about being included in that list. And I was like, oh, I'm curious to see what else is listed there. And we I were the first one. I, mean, I it was so saw funny. our faces and just about lost it. So <laughs> anyway, thank you to Do South Magazine for including us. And um, they are, you know, an online publication. They are planning to move to some quarterly printed publications uh, starting next year. So they're a good resource, though, for, awesome. for Southern cultural topics. All right. Well, today I, I am going to be more in the student seat because we are diving into a topic that Lainey proposed that we discuss here. But when she mentioned it... I literally did not know exactly what she meant. So there's my disclaimer that <laughs> um, I know I'm about to get schooled, and I know that Lainey would not claim to be an expert on this, but she certainly has passion around mm-hmm. it. And so we wanted to spend t- some time today talking about heirloom seeds. Yes. So when you said heirloom seeds, I was like, heirloom, I know what that is. But never heard of heirloom seeds. So you didn't think... Never. Were were you kind of thinking, uh, not an heirloom I necessarily would want was for somebody to pass down (laughs) a little packet of some seed or something. Yeah. This is... Hoping for something a little different than that. This has been in the back of my silverware drawer for 15 years. (laughs) That's right. It's time to pass it on. Yeah, no. I I really didn't know what you were mentioning. So I think, uh, in all honesty, I do hope that, you know, some friends that are listening that you know, we'll learn something today because it's a pretty hot topic right now. Well, I, I am not a master gardener. I'm a very amateur gardener. Um, I do like to cook, but with just those two things, being an amateur and gardener and liking to cook, this yeah. matters. It sure and does. So I want to just dive in. Yeah. Starting just with seed. Okay. God is amazing. Yeah. He puts in a seed... 
a baby plant and its lunch. So, yes. Yeah. That's the, basically what's in there. The, the, Everything it needs. Yeah, all the qualities and attributes the seed needs to grow and then also equipping it with that food to grow. Right. Yeah. That's just, I mean, it's a blueprint for the food that's going to come. Yeah. That's just amazing. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. Um, An heirloom seed comes from open pollinated plants that pass on similar characteristics and traits from the parent plant to the child plant. So there's your heirloom passing Passing on from parent to child. Here's the qualities I'm passing on. Okay. Um, And remember that, and I just wanted to make this to remember heirloom refers to the heritage of a plant while organic refers to a growing practice. Yes. Okay. So that's two different things that we're talking about. Um, And then a lot of people have probably heard GMO. Mm -hmm. That's a big word that you see on packaging now. That you see on things now. Non-GMO. Non-GMO. A GMO is a genetically modified organism. Okay. So, you know, we may not, if you're in the grocery store and you're just grabbing some produce, you're just not necessarily thinking of the history of Right. What's been? You're just yes. like, is, does it the, do the leaves look good? Does exactly. Does the skin yeah. look good? Whatever. Um, but this is a really big deal. Um, and I don't want this to like scare people, some of the things I'm going to talk about. But I do want people to realize that it's a serious thing. Well, and I think that a lot of people, we've been scratching our heads or making <laughs> comments that actually are centering around this, but not really realizing asking what the root why prob- uh, the root. Yeah, the root. <laughs> I like, wasn't even planning on. Yeah, when I, you know, I was um, sharing with you earlier that I've bought strawberries two times now from our mass grocer here, uh-huh. and they just haven't tasted very not juicy. Very, they're, yeah, they're pretty bland. I mean, uh-huh. I, I, it seems so weird to call a strawberry bland it should be so full of flavor right? it was bland two times now and mm-hmm. it is um less than half of what the farmer's market costs it's about $2. Okay. $2. 2.99 mm-hmm. a pint right now for strawberries here and at the farmer's market it's strawberry season and they're seven dollars mm-hmm. for that same pint that th- there is a big difference in the taste and Size and the like size. The s- well, I had mentioned to you, like I've sometimes have bought my strawberries at Costco, and I like Costco. Nothing against Costco, but sometimes they're so big that it kind of freaks me out. Where I'm like, what? What is going on with that? <laughs> <Yeah>. Like, <laughs> I've never grown a strawberry that was that, that size. Yeah. So when I see things like that, I've also kind of laughed at have you ever gotten a baked potato from a place like jason's deli and i'm like what (laughs) how did that even happen yeah that that's so large well i don't know that it's not some of this genetically modified stuff that's going on yeah i guess that's what i was kind of trying to conclude was i think we're seeing this we're just not even pausing to go beyond the saying that's weird yeah that doesn't taste good yeah but then that's kind of where we stop so i'm going to go into a little bit of some things that are going on in the south that i think are great cool but a lot of it came from chefs going i'm still making this the same way i used to and it doesn't taste the same Mm. what's going on big deal for a chef yeah so that's partially exactly what's been going on where they're going my food method's the same right my cookware's the same yeah (laughs) my yeah Whatever. My stove's the same. Yeah. What's going on? My end product. Can only be the food. Yeah. So. Cool. um, And I have, I have, or I think I've seen somewhere that usually heirlooms are 50 years old. Do you think that's? um, Most of the, I think everything that I've seen that name on is. Okay. It's hard to believe that. Things that are from the 60s are 50 years old now. Yeah. But yes, they are. Okay. So. Okay. And some of, yeah. Anyway. Okay. okay. Well, so basically there's a real crisis going on with seed today. It's affecting our whole food chain and the flavor and nutrition of our food. Yeah. So I'm not going to go into a lot of that either, but we all know there's this strange spike in gluten allergies. Absolutely. There's lots of things that are going mm-hmm. on where we're going, hmm, things yeah. that make you go, hmm. Yeah, those allergies don't run in my family or, yeah. 
So, but that's why am I the first to have this strange things going on with wheat Mm -hmm. now? Yep. That kind of thing. So in a nutshell, as most problems in the world, everything comes down to money and greed. I know. I hate that. Um, Large companies, they want more quality, larger size, more resilient to chemicals so that they can more, 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 more. Yeah. Um, And they're not concerned at all, really at all with the flavor. Yeah. I mean, flavor's at the bottom of the list of priority. Sure. Of what's important. And care for the farmer's not necessarily very high on that list either, but that's... Yeah, because I don't think quality control is testing strawberries or any other produce going, this just isn't juicy enough. Right. No. It's like, how much did we get? Yeah. Great. Let's try to get even more. Does it weigh? Go back to the lab and let's modify it again. Does it weigh what it needs to weigh? Okay. Yeah. So um, right now, and I just think this is pretty interesting, there's three companies control 60% of the world's seed and nearly 70% of its agriculture agricultural chemicals and pesticides. What? The world, not U.S. The world. That's why I'm saying this is a global wow. problem now. And these are chemical companies. Monsanto, DuPont, hmm. Syngenta. Um, I got tickled, Larbeth. I don't know if any of our listeners will even know this, what I'm talking about, but you'll know what I'm talking about. In a Jewish um, synagogue, when they read the book of Esther during the season of Purim, okay. whenever they say the name Haman, what does everybody do? Boo. <laughs> yeah. And so for some reason, I had this thought of every time I hear Monsanto now, I'm oh, going to be like, be booing. boo. <laughs> oh, but anyway. <laughs> There's also some strange things happening. Uh, Again, I'm not a scientist nor master gardener, but 70%, 75% of crops have disappeared from 1900 to 2000. Things are just disappearing. Okay. um, Because there's so much, um, like, I don't, my understanding is that uh, they're wiping out a lot of the crops that we were doing. So, and, and, making all seed kind of is becoming the same. So like yes. we don't have maybe 30 varieties of whatever okay. beets. Yeah. <laughs> this one we've got so resilient now that it can grow anywhere in the world. And so we have this one kind. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's a huge so that's, percentage. That's wiping out the other varieties then. And yeah. where are, where are, where are the they? seeds? Yeah. Maybe hopefully somebody's holding on and doing them in their backyard somewhere and we're going to be able to revive it, which I'm going to talk about some things that are happening in the yeah. South. But that's this crazy. is a big deal. 75% of crops have disappeared from 1900 to 2000, changing more in our lifetime than all time before that. Whoa. So... Um, wow. There's things That's that heavy. are going on that we, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to one person change all of this, but I can maybe do my part in supporting some seed that is healthy yeah. and growing it in my little garden right. or whatever. So that's kind of where we're going with this. And so I wanted to mention two names of people that I came across in looking this up that are really important in the South. Yeah. One uh, is named David Shields. Okay. He's a professor at the University of South Carolina. Okay. And the other is Glenn Roberts, who's the founder of Anson Mills in Columbia, South Carolina. Oh, yeah. We've discussed so I've them before. So I mentioned their grits. And yes. I told you I got some of their farro and grits and um, a few different things. So these two guys have been nicknamed Flavor Revivalist. Oh, I love it. And I just love that um, they're partnering together to kind of make this heirloom seed thing. They're, they've taken it very seriously. I, sounds like it. And put, I'm talking about decades of time. Wow. Into, in fact, David Shields, um, well, I'll, I'll just jump in and, and read a little bit about them. Okay. And you're going to appreciate some of these things because it's similar to some of the things you've already said. So whether you know it or not, you've been missing out. You've never tasted a single sweet bite of Bradford watermelon, which David Shields calls one of the absolute finest melons ever created, or a fat, tender stalk of palmetto asparagus, a southern staple until higher-yielding varieties crowded it off the market in the 1920s, or the sweet, tasty Carolina African peanut 
the original southern peanut brought from West Africa in the 16th century. But thanks to Shields and his informal collaborator, Glenn Roberts, among others, it won't be long until you can feast on all these once lost southern flavors. I just love So the, all of the ones that they just mentioned there... Do they have seeds for them? Like, are are are, are yes. they saying that like a Bradford watermelon? We've has... got it now. Yes. Really? Yeah. So it's almost like there's like an endangered seeds list. Oh, it's yeah. Maybe there. But we don't maybe there necessarily is. have the li- full list. But yeah, things are definitely endangered. Okay. So I I just find this fascinating. Huh. So. In fact, even just in talking about watermelon, and I was listening to something, I don't have the notes here, but they were talking about with watermelons, a lot of the really flavorful watermelons had thin rind. Well, companies hated that because when they loaded them up on the trucks to deliver them, all the bottom ones were crushed. Yeah, you can't sling them around as easy. We're going to genetically modify so the rind's real fat, and I can pile them high and get them to the grocers and... Uh, It doesn't matter if they don't have any flavor. The rind's thick enough that I can pile them high and get them to the store. Well, I've wondered before, how is a seedless watermelon even possible? Like, it has to be injected with something to not... They've modified it. Yeah. And again, I'm not a scientist to tell you how all that works. But but something (laughs) had to have been... God didn't make it to be like that. If there are seeded water, if watermelons grow with seeds, then a seedless watermelon has been changed. Had to be tweaked in some way. (laughs) So, yeah. Um, Wow. So these guys, they research and spearhead the return of some of the tastiest grains, seeds, fruits, and vegetables the South ever produced, but which during the last century vanished from fields, seed catalogs, menus, and dinner tables. Wow. So this this professor has been combing through dusty archives and obscure 1800s ag journals in search of culinary gems. He's enlisted farmers to bring back um, these heritage grains, beans, and other all but forgotten crops such as Carolina gold rice and Sea Island red peas. So these guys wow. are in South Carolina, so they're really focusing mostly on, on the, the low country. Yes. Things that have been... That you have, have to start somewhere, too. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, anyway. Um, wow. That is a, a lot of work. A lot of work, yeah. Going through it back and going, Archives. I've never seen this. Let's look dig into that. Oh, I've never even heard of this. Let's dig into that a little bit. Yeah. I, who, ha- who was growing this? Do they have descendants? Like, my would gosh. they possibly, yeah, have any of the seeds somewhere? It's like a whole nother version of Ancestry.com. <laughs> it's, it's so true. SeedAncestry.com. It's so true. So Glenn Roberts and other like-minded growers mimic the ingenious methods of their 1800s forebears, planting different crops together, for instance, and deploying specific crop rotations over a seven-year cycle. Now, I got kind of tickled when I read that. Seven years. <laughs> because I went, hmm... This is interesting that God gave us a lot of scriptures that reference how to do... That's biblical. That's biblical. Yeah. I looked up a couple of scriptures. There were so many that I thought, well, I'm not going to do a whole Bible study on it. But, you know, just a few of the scriptures. Exodus 23.10 says, For six years you are to sow the fields and harvest the crops. But in the seventh year you must let it rest and lie fallow. Deuteronomy 22, 9, you shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed or all of the produce of the seed which you have sown and the increase of the vineyard will become defiled. Yeah. So he lays out these things of how we're to do things well, but we don't always. It's like our days of the week, you know, technically we have six days and then the seventh oh, is supposed to be rest. rest, Sabbath rest. And so same, same with for our that fields. Cycle. They need and, and yeah. A lot of this... So was this like an aha moment in science? Like, oh, the best way to do it is... They probably tried lots of different (laughs) things and went, oh, that first way was better. It's a seven-year rotation. interesting how we do that, isn't it? Yes. Um, 
some t- and this was just another thing part I found interesting here. Sometime during the 20th century, low country food recipes from South Carolina and Georgia, a genre of cooking that had remained unchanged for generations, began to taste markedly different to those who had distinct memories of how dishes were supposed to taste. Yeah. Because culinary techniques had not changed for centuries, the only reasonable explanation for the difference was the ingredients. Hmm. So the first step in solving the problem was realizing that flavor had been lost to begin with. Wow. Which you've noticed in your own. And I'm not even, that's not my job to be. I can't imagine if my job was tied into so producing flavorful things. So you can see why a lot of the chef, the high end chefs are going, oh, we'll get on board with that. I bet. Because they're all about flavor. So anyway, I just, I, I, find this really interesting um well and i think you know of a real fine dining restaurant i don't (laughs) frequent very many but (laughs) i imagine a a plate that is even just a standard size but a lot of times what they're bringing out is something that's very small on the plate and so you don't have a lot of room to mask whatever you're serving in other things it's like it's true there's maybe like three bites and isn't in it what interesting? You're so if the first, you know, it's not like you're going to get to the gooey part or you're going to get to right. the sweeter part. <laughs> like right. if the food's not flavorful, it's only got a few bites to do it. And that's right. Some of these fine dining places. That is so true, Larva. That's a great point. And it really shows you that their mindset is actually the opposite of these huge companies. It's right. not about how they're, much. They're like, oh, just you just need this much. Yes. And it needs to be really flavorful. The opposite of the masses. Yeah. Right. Um, Shields, this David Shields, he's now the chairman of the board of the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation and chair of the Arc of the Taste Southern Region. Since he began the work of of searching for lost seeds, he's helped revive over thirty crops. What? So I just thirty different thirty different things are now going because he's done the work to get them back. So it's amazing. Kudos to David Shields. Absolutely. Um, An unsung hero. That's right. Never heard of him before today, but we He says him. part of understanding how to find seeds today is understanding why seeds were lost in the first place. The answer, for the most part, can be distilled down to one thing, economic value, which mm-hmm. we've already gone into that. Fan, um, fancy way of saying it. <laughs> Mo money, mo problems. Exactly. <laughs> he says, for example... Purple straw wheat, which I've never heard of, okay. has grown in large quantity, was grown in large quantities in the 1970s. It was the original cake, whiskey, and biscuit wheat. Oh my gosh. But when farmers realized that they could grow three times as much wheat during a year, this better tasting wheat was driven off the market. Oh, Wow. So this is the kinds of things that are going on. Um, He says, as we've streamlined our agricultural processes, focusing on producing the greatest quantity of crops in the quickest way possible, flavor has been the real loser. When it was formerly what guided how we ate. Yeah. Farmers started using more productive seeds that relied on petroleum-based fertilizer rather than older varieties, which relied on complex root systems for nutrients, say. Okay. Um, so, I watched a movie that I wanted to mention on. It was just on YouTube, like that a documentary. Was really good. It was a documentary, okay. and it's called Seeds of Freedom. Okay. Um, so I'll give you the link to okay. put up I'll on put this. It in our show notes. Under thirty minutes. Was it on YouTube? It was, okay. and it's narrated by Jeremy Irons. If you remember him. He's oh like, yeah. yeah, he was. Um, no. He was in lots of things. Yeah. But he's just the narrator. But it literally goes global. I mean, they're interviewing people in India and people in Africa and farmers that okay. say, oh, well, you know, for so long we grew our food this way. But these big companies came and offered us seed and offered us fertilizer and okay. like made this look all great. Yeah. Like we're- they started then using, doing mm-hmm. the way they were told to do it. Mm-hmm. And now they can't even they get can't even their get old back. back. Yeah. 
because the seeds are gone. And then another thing that's also really sad, but I can see how it could have happened, is let's say in this little village in India that they were growing, let's say, 30 different things. Okay. Well, this company says, you know what? We'll give you more if you'll just grow this one thing. Mm-hmm. All this one thing. Yeah, use all the all of your land. So let's to just say do they're this. doing all tea now. Yeah. Well, they can't feed their village now because they were having enough of different things right. that they would try, you know, barter and that kind of thing. Well, now everybody's doing the same thing. Man can't live on tea alone. That's right. Yeah. So it's a big deal. It what is. we're talking about is a really big deal. When you think about that three companies could be holding so much of the world's food supply right. in the palm of their hand. Yeah. So wow. anyway, what do we do, right? I guess we just want to... What do we do and what do we do here as Southerners, especially since we focus so much on Southern right. culture? Right. And we have some great... I, I think of the... the Probably heirloom seed I think of when I'm as a Tennessean mm-hmm. is the Cherokee tomato. Have you ever seen the Cherokee tomato? It's almost a purple color no. and it's really big. Okay. Um, but it was planted, I actually looked it up in the 1880s by the Cherokee Indians. Okay. Is, who was, that's where it got its name. I don't know where that, you know, where originally it. Yeah. It may have just got put it here. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. But, um, Anyway, that one is still around, but okay. I don't see it in stores for sale, but I've bought those Cherokee okay. seeds before. Okay. It's a good tomato for like a sandwich or something because it's okay. so big. Yeah. And yeah. I just I think the color's really cool. Mm-hmm. It doesn't look quite as, it's like a reddish purple. Okay. I know what you're talking about now that you're saying okay. tomato sandwiches. Yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, I, I do have a couple of seed companies I just wanted to mention. Sure. If people are thinking, oh, I want to get us some good heirloom seeds right. from, that grow in the South. Okay. Um, one is a company called Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. They're out of Virginia. Okay. And on their website, they have a whole section for heirlooms, and they have a section for things that grow in the Southeast. Okay. So... Some of that's Makes, overlap, so, yeah, even. yeah. But um, but if you're here and to check want to out, growing something that does well here, right? Yeah, that's some. You know, they they have that spelled out pretty easily on their website. Uh huh. And another one is called AppalachianSeeds.com. Okay. So they have a lot of the heirloom varieties and um, things like that on their site as well. And then I also wanted to mention that Sean Brock who is a chef that became famous out of Charleston Mm -hmm. is now here in Nashville and is working on a, sounds like a pretty big project. Project. Yeah. Um, Kind of a salute to Appalachian food culture. Yeah. His place is going to include an heirloom seed bank where you can go and buy heirloom seeds there. Cool. Um, and he's definitely in friendship with this David Shields. Right. Um, so I've seen them on a couple of TV shows together. Well, that's cool because that really does. I mean, I guess any restaurant or um, farmer could tell you, you know, it's an heirloom variety that you're eating. But if you could actually go see at the restaurant that what they're growing, yeah, they're also selling those same seeds, yeah, you would know even what you're really going to get. Know. Yeah. yeah, you're not just getting the blueprint; you're getting right. the blueprint and seeing yeah. that. Yeah, and he's super passionate about this subject. Um, in fact, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of him. His, his got tattoo. this whole sleeve on. I think it's his left arm of vegetables, no way. and that he's passionate about. Wow! And so I just think that's. That's whole dedica- other level That's of dedication <laughs> in a modern way. Um, and then there's also this concept of a seed library where I don't, okay. I haven't seen this in action, but I did look it up online where you would go in to a place, check out a seed. I don't know the full process of this, but right. I, I believe the expectation is you're going to go grow this the seed. plant uh-huh. and then bring some seed back. Wow. So I don't know what the timeline is on all of this checkout process. This but seems like a lot to manage on the, the end of whoever's checking it out. Absolutely. But kudos to them for taking it on. But I mean, put it also puts power in the hands of the people I know. to help, to I not know. just make, make these two guys that are passionate about it and have right. them do all of it. Right. Like, 
Let's get all of us involved. That's interesting. So, um, checking out seeds. If you, if our listeners know of any seed libraries in the South, I sure would love to yeah see more on that well my guess is that it, they're going to be growing too in the same way that i think awareness of just the backstory of food is yeah. growing yeah i'm sure we'll have more seeds. so uh, you know i don't know that we're going to be able to change the world's food supply but i'd like to change the food that i have in my own kitchen a yeah. little bit you yeah. know if i can grow a few things and keep a few things going yeah that are um important to my region i want to do a little bit to help with that yeah so So if you got to pick one seed oh that you were (laughs) that you would you know you're going to go check it out and you're going to tend to it what's the this is a great question i was interested in this um well i guess when i think southern things i do think um tomatoes tomatoes corn yeah but even if the wheat that we were using that was the best for biscuits and whiskey that's and all the that one that is stood gone, out I'm to like, me. Maybe the, 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 our, if our biscuits and our whiskey are in our original K being tampered with and have been have lost their original stamina and flavor. And that's been in my lifetime. Right. That that's happened. Yeah. Because it says in the 70s that was still. That's crazy. So it's been since my lifetime that that's gone away but doesn't that also mean it might have a better chance of somewhere making it's a not comeback? too far away yeah yeah so i might want the purple straw wheat okay that's See. what i mean when you were saying things earlier i was that's the one that stood out to me mm-hmm. um so yeah. interesting yeah so anyway wow. that's what i have on seed but um it's well, a pretty big deal so let's do our part that <laughs> is Good information and one that I'm, I definitely feel more knowledgeable on now that you say it. Now I know not only what an heirloom seed is, but the fact that it's being, they're being saved and it takes I, some work though. So yeah, all of that to say, I, I don't know how much, you know, seed cost from Anson Mills versus seed from, you know, some GMO place. Right. Yeah. I would be shocked if it could be i mean it, it's still seed so it's not crazy expensive exactly yeah it's packets the, are still going to be five dollars or it's something not the it's grown not the grown product so because it still requires work and good soil and right. good tending so yeah you're right i mean we're not talking about the finished product right price difference the right. seed has got to be a lot less but um i think even if we could just change our mindset to flavor and not just quantity yeah. Like you were, let's go back to your strawberry example. Okay. So you maybe could get a huge thing of strawberries for two ninety nine, or $7 for a smaller thing. But if it's got more flavor, do yeah. you even need as many? Well, no, the, they're sitting in my the, refrigerator going bad because I already tasted several of them and they weren't any good. About it. So basically I paid two ninety nine for like five strawberries. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's how many I'm going to end up eating. But, you know, if you think about a shortcake, you're making strawberry shortcake or something. Yeah. Maybe if you still made it the same way and you just didn't have as many yeah. on it, it yeah. still could taste better. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yes. Too. Agree. Yeah. And that's what these chefs are doing, you know, when they give you the smaller portion. But if the flavor is exploding... It does, yeah, is you're still, still loving still it. Better yeah. Than, yeah, yeah, you're savoring those bites. Mm-hmm. You're not just shoveling it in your mouth. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. Good job, Lainey. Hey, Thank well. you. So, I, I, I get excited about that kind of thing. Yeah, I think you I'm should a little nerdy. consider going in for a master gardener ship or whatever the certification is to complete that because you've definitely got the passion around it so there won't be any tattoos of veggies but i did like talking about (laughs) it (laughs) wow well that is going to do it for this episode of the steel magnolias podcast and i did want to thank those of you that have been writing reviews they are so endearing and so sweet to read so thank you For those of you that have recently um, completed that, and we do hope that you 
We'll share this with your friends and pass on the word. That's really the the best way that anyone hears about this. On your summer road trips or beach trips with your friends, tell them. Yeah, I've had some people say they're going to be binge listening because they've got some (laughs) trips coming up. So if that's you, that's fine too. We don't care how you listen. We We just just want you to listen. listen. All right, guys, have a great time uh, or great week, and we will see you here next time.